going to talk about case two, Mrs. TC, 64-year-old Mrs. TJ, TC, name changes, with a change in bowel habit, past medical history of IBS, psoriasis, smokers in 16, taking buscopan PRN. Before starting, you decide to review the lower GI cancer referral guidance. So let's jump into the first question. Which of the below statements actually you have a read of it? I'm going to give you 57 seconds. Have a think and jot down your answer. A, B, C, D, or E. Okay, the majority of answers are C, good, well done. C is the right answer. 61 year old male with iron deficiency anemia is the one that would warrant an urgent two referral. When it comes to lower GI cancer referral guidance, it's quite hard because there are three or four different age ranges that you have to remember, and these are quite close to those boundaries. So I can see why people are putting B and, and A, and some of you are putting uh, D as well, but yes, yeah, C is the right answer. So A is not right because you've got to be 40 with abdominal pain and unexplained weight loss. B is not right, and I know it's just A, 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 B, you know what I mean. And B is not right because you need to be 50 years of age with unexplained rectal bleeding. C is right because if you're 60, with iron deficiency anemia, you do need a two-week referral. A is not right because you need to be 60 with a change in bowel habit. And then E is not right because this says the test shows absence of occult blood, but if it showed occult blood, then of course it would be an urgent referral. So that word absence changes option E. So you guys put E, so I wonder if you just missed that word um, absence out when you read it so quickly so what does the guidance say it's quite a hard guidance like i said but there are some key things to remember if you're over 40 with unexplained weight loss and abdominal pain it's a two-week referral if you're over 50 with unexplained rectal bleeding if you're over 60 with iron deficiency anemia or if you're over 60 with a change in bowel habit or if you have a test which shows occult blood in the feces whether it's an fit test or fecal occult blood test depending on which test has been done you'd consider a referral in certain situations rectal or abdominal mass and if you're under 50 with rectal bleeding and any of these four things, including iron deficiency anemia. So, again, it's quite a difficult guideline to remember. If you're going to remember one thing, make sure you remember these definite four things to do an urgent referral for. If you can remember the considerations, that's great. But definitely remember these first four categories. And that's why option C was the answer for this question. OK, so how are you going to approach data gathering? Bearing in mind what we talked about in the first half of this webinar, what are the kind of things? Let's talk about the three sections. What are the three bubbles again that you're going to be talking about in terms of data gathering? And we'll break down what these three bubbles show. So, what are the three the bubbles? Let's see if we can remember those three bubbles that we talk about all the time. Oh, I think I jumped a little bit too far. What are they? Yeah, good. People are saying red flag, psychosocial ice. Good. You guys are, yeah, knew that well before we started this webinar, which is great. So, if you look at those three bubbles, then there's a lot of remember data gathering is not a diagnosis, it's about what are the issues that I need to understand can help me manage the second half, okay? So if you think about red flags, of course, you've got your nice cancer guideline referrals and you've got to go through all of those symptoms. So this person's had loose stool for four months. Um, you've got to rule out the need for, to, for any acute things. So are they actually unwell? If they're having loose stool for four months, has it got to the stage where they're dehydrated? Is, have they had a recent big bleed, for example, or a recent, uh, are, they, are they getting upper GI vomiting as well, hematemesis? Again, things that would make you think, hmm, this might be cancer, but actually this is probably an admission instead. And then obviously go through all the basic stuff like symptoms, duration, what's actually happening, et cetera, other symptoms. So those, again, we're pretty good at, but you do need to make sure you're demonstrating your ability to go through red flags, even though it's obvious that there are red flags or it's obvious that there aren't red flags. This is an assessment, and you've got to make sure that you're going through it step by step. Think about psychosocial support systems. If you're thinking that I'm going to be doing a possible two-week referral for this, support systems becomes huge. Who's at home with this person? Are they married? Have they got kids? Have they got family? Have they got friends? If they have, have they talked to these people or not? Are you the first person they're talking about? Again, you've got to start thinking a little bit ahead because you're thinking potential breaking bad news here. So you've got to be thinking, okay, when this person leaves my consultation room and goes home tonight, who are they going to talk to? Who's around them? What's the setup? You cannot be asking about what the setup is once you've broken bad news. You've got to be doing all of this in advance. And this is where the psychosocial bubble comes in. And if it's a diet change, of course, that can impact bowels in some way. Work, for example, if you think it could be an IBS flare, for example, like that, then what's the work? And she says it's very stressful at present. That's her current situation. She works as a, a secretary and it's super, super stressful right now over the last three or four months. And then, you know, smoking and alcohol and again, link it, make it relevant. Sometimes, you know, certain things in our lifestyle, certain habits can link in with our bowels and how they function. It can ask you if you smoke or drink alcohol, not just do you smoke or do you drink alcohol? It's about making it relevant and showing that you've chosen these questions for their particular situation. And then, of course, the third bubble is their mind. OK, if you don't understand these things, then you might do the two week referral. You might break bad news, but you haven't really understood what their mind is saying. So their ideas are that it's the stress at work that's making their IBS worse. Their concern is not a tumor or a cancer or some kind of pathology. Their concern is they're going on holiday in three weeks. And if they're having all this loose stool, 
it's going to impact their holiday. So this is an example of if you just say, is there anything you're worried this might be, then they would say, well, no. And then later on, the worry about the holiday would come up. But if you keep it open, like, is there anything that's worrying you about all of this? Then that's where the holiday bit might come up. So remember, keep it open as, as much as you can when it comes to ice. And then her expectation is simple. The bear might to help the diarrhea. Um, she's heard that it's a good drug and she wants you to prescribe it for her. But again, let's say ask. I don't know what it is. I, I'm assuming. I'm assuming that maybe she wants a diagnosis or maybe she wants me to rule certain things out. Or maybe she wants an examination. Maybe she wants a test or maybe she wants a treatment. I don't know. But unless I ask, I'm not going to understand what's going on in their mind. And therefore, the manager is going to remain incomplete until they bring it out when they want to bring it out. So you do a bit more data gathering, loose stool for four months, occasional blood mixed in with the loose stool, no donal pain, no weight loss, very different to her usual IBS features. She had IBS for a long time, remember, so she thinks it's just worse than IBS, but actually when you drill it down, it's very different to her usual IBS features. She's tried loperamide, which didn't really help, so why does she want loperamide? I don't know why I put that in. Why she doesn't, she, maybe she did try loperamide, it didn't, but she wants it anyway because she thinks it may be a higher dose might help, I don't know, and she's got this holiday in a few weeks. Okay, so these are the kind of issues it was starting to pick up. And she's stressed at work. So these are the kind of things that you're picking up in day to gather. Even your brain's thinking, gosh, red flags, red flags, red flags, alarm symptom, alarm symptom. This is a two-week referral. This is a two-week referral. There are other things that you need to be understanding to help you do that second half a little bit easier and just go in and do the breaking bad news as per a textbook, for example. So examiner, BMI is 23, six months ago it was 24, so a slight drop, abdomen is NAD, the PR examination reveals a firm pectoral mass, but there's no blood on the thing at that point. How do you manage this? Let's talk about, I mean, it's very obvious she's going to need a two-week referral, that's obvious, but how are you going to manage this particular situation, bearing in mind what we talked about in the first, in the first half? How are you going to manage all of this stuff? Or is your brain going to go, you know what, forget all that other stuff, like holiday and stuff, that's not important, this is a two-week referral, this takes priority. I'm going to just talk about two referral. How do you balance this when you're trying to manage a person who wasn't even thinking about cancer before she walks in the door? Give us some ideas. Um, breaking bad news. So people are talking about things like spikes and you know, you take time to uh, give her to react and talk about the holiday and cancel the holiday and um, do you want family in with you? Okay. Um, talk about referral first. Um, you know, safe uh, cancer. Um, people talking about the, the the kind of delaying of the word cancer. So, um, what's the word you're looking at? Um, buffering it or little layers, for example. Begin with ice, okay? Okay. When is she going away? Discuss that we need to know too. Okay. So good logistics, maybe. Yeah. Look, it's lots to cover, isn't it? You might have three minutes, and you've got to do this breaking bad news, and you've got to talk about all the other, almost predict the other issues that are going to come back to you. So let's talk about so remember, situation management first. You're not managing just the BBN bit. You're managing the whole lot, including all the issues. So we'll talk about breaking bad news first because that's the bit that you're going to have to think about at some stage. And when it comes to breaking bad news, people talk a lot about you know having several stages and several layers. It could be this, could be that, could be this, could be this. And then you get to the word cancer. And that's fine. If you've got 20 minutes with somebody, you can take that approach. But in an assessment, in a role play point of view, you don't have the luxury of I don't know, 15 minutes to do this. You've got probably three to four minutes to do this and then talk about the next bits as well. So we talk about the best case scenario, worst case scenario. You can't go in and just throw in, of course, the word cancer. So you need a buffer, you need a breaker, but you don't need 15 breakers. Like one breaker is fine. So yeah, Mrs. Dexter, thank you so much for um, for talking to me about all of that stuff and thank you for letting me examine you. Explain the examination. Um, you know, I'll be honest, when it comes to a you know symptoms like you have, or when it comes to a mass that we find down below like this, look, there could be lots of different reasons, okay? Best case scenario, it could be, I don't know, something like a polyp, something that can cause bleeding, that can cause a change in bowel, but we don't worry about those kind of things too much. But Mrs. X, when we find this kind of symptom and we find this kind of examination, we just need to make sure we're ruling out what we call the worst case scenario here. And by that, I mean things like cancer. Okay, so 30 seconds, 40 seconds, the key word is out. Because until that word comes out, until you say that word cancer, not much else is going to happen. Like reactions are not going to happen. Questions are not going to happen. Those difficult situations aren't going to happen. The time that you need to give them is not going to start yet. So you're delaying everything happening. You're delaying all your ability to score more because you've delayed that word cancer. So best case scenario, worst case scenario. This works with any kind of breaking bad news. Say, for example, you've got, I don't know, someone with a testicular lump. Sit them down, examination, you know, finding this, you're right, we found a lump down below, exactly as you said. Now, look, when it comes to lumps down below, there are obviously lots of different reasons, you know, that it could be happening by, you know, best case scenario, it could be something called a cyst, like, you know, collection of fluid. We, we don't tend to worry about those kind of things too much. But, you know, when we get a lump like this down below, we just need to make sure we're not missing what we call 
the worst case scenario here, and by that, I mean things like cancer. Okay, so you've got your buffer, but you've got the keyword out. But I don't want to spend too much time doing that because I've got so many more things that I need to talk about that they're going to also ask me about. And the bell's going to go well before that if I don't give myself a chance. But once you've done that, you obviously give the time, you give the, the, you know, the reaction time and you, you know, silent nodding and showing that I'm here and I can you know, take your time, etc. You do all of that. And when the person's ready to go again, and that might be five seconds, it might be a minute. Like you don't know that, but that, they, they deserve that time to take that all in. But when they're ready to go again, that's when you need to control the next minute. That's when issues come on the table. Because what most people do, they'll talk about, they'll talk about, okay, what happens next now? And you'll start talking about urgent referral and what they're gonna do in the clinic and all the tests that can happen and the biopsies and all that kind of stuff, the secondary care, the specialists. That's where your brain wants to go because that's the medicine. But you've got to take a pause and think, hold on, there are other issues here that I need to make sure I've demonstrated before I get lost in the detail. Issues on the table. Mr. X, you know what? Look, I can see this is a lot of information, Mrs. X, to take in, and I know this is not what you're expecting. But look, I think there are a couple of things here that we probably need to focus on going forward. Firstly, look, we need to talk a little bit about what happens next, okay? And there might be other tests that need to happen. There might be specialists that get involved, you know, hospital appointments and things. I will we'll talk about step by step what's going to happen next and who's going to be involved. Secondly, you mentioned family, you mentioned husband, you mentioned children, and you know, it can be difficult at times like this. So if you need us to help in any way, discuss with them, go through things, we're happy to do that, but that's totally up to you. But just so you know, we're here for that as well. Thirdly, you mentioned that you thought this could all be due to stress at work. Sadly, I don't think it is, but if you're stressed at work, then maybe some time off might be useful, especially talking about what we're gonna be going through over the next couple of weeks. So that is certainly something that we can help with if you need to. And fourthly, I don't want to jump the gun yet, but you did mention that you're going on holiday in a couple of weeks. Now, that may be something that we need to think about based on what happens in the next couple of weeks and where we go from here. So just putting things out on the table, I think there's a couple of things there that I think are really important that we're going to need to focus on going forward. But maybe right now we focus a bit on what actually happens next so that we can talk about and plan the next few steps. How does that sound? Or out of all of those things, was there anything in particular that you wanted me to focus on first? Oh, doctor, okay, so what happens next? And then you go into the next bit. But the key is before you get trapped in the detail, make sure you get a solid base. Make sure you show that, look, I am aware as a clinician that there is way more to think about from me, from my point of view, than just when's the referral and who's going to do what and what test you're going to have. Okay, that's really important because if you wouldn't think about, I'm in an assessment and I've got to score marks here then everybody is going to do a two-week referral in this situation. Everybody, that is not gonna get you full marks. That is gonna get you a pass, probably, because you're doing the right thing. But if you wanna score, you know, go up the ladder, then you've gotta be demonstrating that, okay, look, I'm going beyond doing what anybody would do. I've understood that this information that I've got to work around has, has got lots of implications, and some of them have been mentioned already. So I am bringing these back and showing that I'm looking at your whole situation as you as a person, not I'm looking at your symptoms and thinking, what do I do next? That is super, super important. So that allows you to do a patient-led management. Now, if you don't do the hard work early on and get this stuff out, it's very hard to do a patient-led management because you'll mention the word cancer, you'll start trying to talk about refer you know, referrals and tests and stuff, and then they will start talking about these things. What about my holiday? And what about my work? How do I, how do I cope with work? And then you have to track back. Oh yeah, you mentioned that, and then it gets harder to manage, and it looks like a doctor-centered management plan. And that's where the interpersonal skills can get knocked off because it looks like you're kind of following whatever they're saying rather than you're in control. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And I hope it shows you how two very different cases, the situation management approach, the issues on the table approach, is going to help you achieve a lot more in a very short period of time than if you're trying to go bang, 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 bang and try and prioritize and try and get through everything one by one. Okay, so she asked you about risk factors. Now you've done all that and she's asking about risk factors. So which of the below risk factors is not known to increase risk of colorectal cancer? Let's just get a quick answer for this. I'm sure a lot of you guys will do this a bit fine. What do you think is the answer to this one? We're near the end now. I'm sure you guys, your, your brains are frazzled by this point. Okay, five seconds. Just put something down if you can, guys. Five, four, three, two, one. The answer is D. Well, I don't know if you got D. It's not a low meat diet, it's a high meat diet, low fiber diet, 
either diet things you've got to think about when it comes to colorectal cancer early menopause is a risk factor of colorectal cancer it's all to do with the hormonal levels um, IBD of course Crohn's osteocolitis does put you at high risk of colorectal cancer and of course family history of colon cancer does put you at high risk so the answer here is D because it's a high meat diet that puts you at high risk so a few key things to take away before we close today about colorectal cancer so risk factors like we talked about family history IBD high meat low fiber familial polyposis is a big one two-thirds of colorectal cancer happen in the colon about a third happen in the rectum like this particular case seems like most are adenocarcinomas and they develop polyps initially very presentation based on where they are. So if the left side of colorectal cancers, you're gonna get the classic stuff of bleeding, pain, obstruction, maybe tenesmus. If it's more right-sided colon cancers, so further round, then you may present with other things like anemia, weight loss, a mass, for example. Investigation, of course, will include things like colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, barium animus, heat to colon geography, again, depending on a person-by-person -person basis, biopsy ultimately as well. You may get letters and things and questions based around your Duke scoring, Duke's A to Duke's B, Duke's B means metastasized. And then management, of course, is going to be based on patient to patient and varies kind of person to person, but it could be a right or left hemicolectomy, it could be a sigma colectomy, it could be a, a reception, an AP or anti reception, different treatments, different surgeries based on many different factors, of course, but just good to get an overall overview in case it comes up in an exam. Thank you so much for your time, guys. We've gone over a little bit, as I tend to do, but hopefully we've covered a lot of ground.